All right, welcome back from the break, everyone. Um, as you probably are aware by now, I, my name's Brian Hardiman, president of Thunderhead Engineering. Um, you're actually kind of all at my mercy right now, full transparency. I didn't have a chance to practice this presentation, so, um, and it's 40 some odd slides, so it may take me too long or I might be done in 20 minutes if I forget what to say, so. Um, but that's okay, this isn't a terribly uh, deep talk, um, but I thought I'd uh, talk through some recent uh, research, new feature work that we've done in Pathfinder um, that we did in coordination with one of our clients trying to model more complicated scenarios. And um, there aren't a whole lot of great formulas and, and uh, relationships to work through with this, but um, I think I can talk through um, how we thought about solving this problem um, from a user interface perspective and a specification perspective to get more um, complicated behaviors in Pathfinder models. Um, as such, I'm gonna start a little bit with a review of the way Pathfinder works in general. Many of you, if you've, if you've used Pathfinder, will already be aware of that, but I think it gives a little bit of context to the new stuff that we've been doing. So I'll try to keep that to not more than a third of what I'm gonna talk about here. Um, Pathfinder was originally released in 2009 which sounds like a long time ago now, um, but primarily focused at just evacuation and egress um, simulation problems for in-building. I mean, we see models now from customers all the time doing all sorts of things that are not in-building um, evacuation. Um, but as such, the original implementation was the primary behavior of these simulated agents were to seek the closest or fastest exit from the space. Um, and also the very original um, version, its primary goal too was to do what in our code is called the SFPE mode, but basically just automate what you could do by hand to satisfy an SFPE um, handbook calculation. So travel distance, queuing time. Um, but over time we've added more options to make that richer, including uh, concepts such as ref refuge rooms, um, occupant sources where you, know, you can just have people appear at the door. Um, or fill rooms so that when people do go into a room, there's a little bit of smarts to like where they wait to get out of someone's, someone's way. Um, attractors was a new feature added a couple of years ago in 2021, which was a means of making that behavior of go find the exit or go to this room a little bit richer because it added sort of a temporary or permanent change of behavior. So if you were near one of these attractor definitions, it might swap your behavior from go to this room to go to the exit, for example. Um, but that's basically what it was limited to. And then we generalized that concept just last year into what's called triggers in Pathfinder. So reviewing the, the original movement algorithm, um, the details, we try to keep as much of how it works uh, open and available for everybody to review so that they do understand, like when we had that question on the fatigue or the room travel penalties, all of that's documented in the technical reference. Um, there's a link there, which doesn't help you much, I suppose, without um, a hyperlink availability, but I also put an image there on the current version of the website. Sometimes it's not obvious if you go to documentation, it dumps you into the user manual, but if you click that little user manual drop down, that's where you can find the other variations of our documentation, including the verification uh, guide. So the, that agent movement process from the original version on basically broke down into three general steps. The goal selection, where do you want that agent to go? Wayfinding, how are they gonna get from where they start to that point? and then the actual locomotion of, of moving across the model to get there. And so that includes you know, the actual just plain movement of you know, modeling acceleration and velocity of, of the bipedal human, um, and also the conflict portion of you know, what do you do when you run into another crowd of people or cross paths with someone going over there when you're going over here. Um, so at the beginning is the goal selection um, which sets either your final goal or your next point along the way. And in Pathfinder, we use the concept of a behavior specification. So you basically set a priori up front what you want a simulated, simulated agent to do. Um, and there's generally three types of goals for that. There's a seek goal to go somewhere, which might be a room or an exit. Um, there are idle goals, which might be to wait for some time 
or to wait for some event like an elevator to arrive or a queue to get to the front of the queue and the queue action to become available, or instant goals, which are just kind of actions and the behaviors that do something immediately, um, which might be change your profile to something else or because you've just gone here and you've picked up luggage, so now you're gonna move, move more slowly. Um, but all of these are set up up front, so you have to decide at the beginning of your model how you want everybody to behave and how you're gonna model those and what assumptions you're using. Um, and some behaviors are sort of implied by these higher level goals, like if, your room, if you have a room goal, then the occupants will, you know, as I mentioned, use this room filling, or exit goals are a little bit richer than just go to this room because there's a bit of logic defined in there of how do you pick an exit, right? Is it just one or is it a set of doors or Generally, the, the algorithm is picked the shortest or the fastest time exit from where you are. Um, so specifying goals, as I said, is kind of done through the behavior. This is just a picture of the user interface if you want to know where to find that stuff. And you can also see here, if I find the fancy pointer, on the right that we have um, all of the possible actions that you can build up into a behavior. So you can use any sequence of these to build up a particular behavior um, to define what an occupant does through the model. And that'll be important later on as we think of, okay, how do we make this more complicated <laughs> as opposed to simpler. But so the wayfinding part, once you've selected a goal, you have to get there somehow. So that's why, the, why the uh, Pathfinder models have a movement mesh, we basically take whatever you've defined as rooms, stairs, doors, convert it into a set of triangles that are all connected, so it's a graph in computer, computer science terms, so that we can search that graph and find the way out. Um, so all of these are, everything that you put in the model is basically subdivided into these connected triangles to enable this stuff. And part of that is, is done with what's called an A-star graph search, if you're a algorithmic nerd, you'll know what that is. Basically, it's, it's a maze solving problem to find ways between points A and B on a connected mesh. So we do that and it will tell you like, here's all the ways to the exit from where you are. And so then you can pick the shortest one. Um, and then those answers are then later refined to remove extra points, simplify the path. And you basically get a set of points from A to B to get where you're going. Um, we additionally refine those a bit um, with curve fits and things to, you know, instead of just a straight line from here, and this is, there's a lot of nuances under the hood that I won't really go into detail, but like there's even, these points are not just tight to the corner here that the occupant has to go around because the occupant has space, right? So we're actually essentially projecting a cylinder or a, a sphere moving through um, to, to the exit to, to get these waypoints, these intermediate waypoints. Um, but then we fit those with splines so that the actual movement that an occupant tries to follow looks more natural. Um, see how I'm doing on my time, 22.02, not too far. Um, so then in the room itself, there's another level of path planning that happens. And this is basically, this gets toward those comments about selecting the escalator or uh, the room penalty. Um, that in-room is basically where in the original Pathfinder algorithm most occupants or agents make their decisions. I mean, otherwise they're basically being told where to go and how fast by the behavior in the profile. But we have an assumption that these agents basically all know everything about the building. Probably they don't in real life, but that's the default assumption. But that they don't know everything about conditions in the building, right? I don't know if there's a queue downstairs in the lobby, but I do know if there's a queue in this room. So we use that assumption to use what we call the locally quickest algorithm to pick, okay, for the next goal where I'm trying to reach, which might be downstairs, you know, I might be able to go, I guess there's no doors back here. There's a door over there. Maybe there's a, a path through that door and a path through that door. And so I look how long it takes through each of those to go, and I use conditions in the room. If I see a giant queue over there, I might choose over here because it's a shorter wait total. So we allow, that's the only kind of artificial intelligence that our occupants have as far as decision making is which door to pick out of a current room. So sometimes, and this is kind of an aside, but that's why I often uh, guide customers into, if you see this giant room in a stadium with one big room, modeling the entire concourse, 
you may not see exactly expected behavior because some of these other things like the distance penalty don't work exactly as you might expect because it doesn't quite match the assumption of the model. So sometimes it helps to break these up into east concourse, west concourse, even if there's not a door there, but to put a connection to split up the, the model and then you get smarter decisions of the occupants along the way. Um, anyway, and so I think I already covered, I'm not really looking at my bullets, as I said, I didn't practice. <laughs> but um, the big part here too is that these can be influenced by the door, door choice parameters and that's where you get at things like you know, the, the room distance penalty, or you can even model other things with different assumptions. Like if you'd rather people not have much global knowledge of the building, you can just say, well, always prefer the closest exit in my room. And then people will always just go, they won't care how the rooms are connected, they'll just find their quickest way out of each room that they're in. And you can model that by tweaking some of these parameters. Um, I think I already kind of covered that bottom point. And then this is just an example showing where you find these in Pathfinder. This is inside, I believe, the simulator settings. I should have put that on here, but, and then it's the door choice tab. So these are fair, oh no, these are actually in the profile. So these can actually be changed for each profile of occupant types in the model if you needed to do that. And then actually getting around, um, as I mentioned, there's a smooth path fit to these curves that you follow, and then you use Fairly basic physics equations, you know, you speed up with an acceleration, you move a particular velocity, you have a turning rate. Um, SFPE mode, as I kind of already alluded to, is basically just an automation of the hand calcs. And then we have the original sort of other smart uh, option in Pathfinder, which is the steering mode, which is based on this uh, published work a long time ago called inverse steering, where basically you're taking a set of directions where you're like, okay, I'm here, I'm trying to go there but there might be things in my way, by things meaning generally other people. But so you take a set of, of options of ways you can go and you calculate a cost with going that direction. You know, if it's way over here, well, that's a high cost because I want to go over there. But if there's a, I'm going to hit somebody right here, maybe, well, maybe that's a higher cost, so I do need to go a little bit to the left. And it combines all of these cost submodels, um, which there are several, you know, there's a, there's a desire to be idle sometimes or stay away from other people. So those feed into the cost. Colliding with geometry is part of the cost. Colliding with other ob uh, obstacles or uh, other occupants is part of the cost, as is, that's how we build in, like we talk about Fruin all the time and speed density. That's how we make our model align with speed density curves that, you, that you're assuming as the engineer is that we're, okay, if I go over here, my density lets me have the speed. That's kind of, it's kind of the inverse of how you might think, but that's how the speed density gets uh, incorporated. Um, and then there's special cases that go into this too with the crowds, like making sure that you don't go in and out into the elevator lobby and back in the door over and over and over because you just keep leaving one room and the other. Um, but I think that's about the basis of the original algorithm, right? So it's these steps of where do I want to go? How do I find it? And then how do I move around basically in the room you're in to get there? Um, I think Brian covered some of this stuff in his talk, but I just wanted to highlight that there is this debug mode in the simulator uh, uh, running dialogue that lets you help understand kind of what's going on if you do have one of these big rooms and you don't know where, why people are choosing a particular door. You can look at all the nitty gritty details and you can see here like these are the, the inverse steering directions that are being considered and you can see the path they're trying to follow and there's a whole ton of factors that probably don't mean anything to you but if you they might <laughs> and they certainly can help if you're talking to our support um, and even like with that locally quickest selecting a door within a room there is a tab here with all of the the uh, numbers that go into that um, for a particular occupant at any given time so I probably talked five minutes more than I should have on that one. But, um, and I didn't cover a bunch of other things, like we have a way to model vehicles, which generally means like for us, a wheelchair or a bed or something like that. Uh, family grouping, assistance. So often you can mark a wheelchair vehicle as requiring assistance and then people can go move those around the space. And elevators are part of that too and, and interact with all of those uh, movement steps. Um, but what I really like to talk about then, how did we 
go beyond just this simple behavior of go from A to B or this, this chain of events that basically you have to just create a behavior description to tell everybody what to do. Um, as I mentioned before, we added attractors in 2021 and basically that was intended for side quests sort of. It was this, these regions you could define like say in the, in the concourse of a stadium that says, oh, when I'm passing through here with my goal to find my seat, that I might stop and consider buying a hot dog. And we might want 10% of the people passing through to do that side behavior and then resume on with their original. And so that's how that one was designed. Um, and that was useful for certain cases like, you know, that or going to the restroom or, or modeling people around a, a maybe even shopping um, or in a, in a gallery, but it didn't really handle more complicated things. And last year we had um, a project where we were working with uh, one of our customers and partners, GHD uh, Movement Strategies. Um, it was with uh, Dan and uh, Aoife there. Um, and we ended up generalizing attractors into a concept we call triggers, which then basically expands what you can do with the concept of an attractor. Um, and that led to additional things like moving triggers, creation, deletion. I'll go through those in a moment. Um, but kind of as an example, here's what we could do with the tractors. And this is probably a stock 3D geometry that's supposed to be like a gallery or something. And so we have all these people moving around, but a certain percentage stop to look at things and then they move on. So the, the advantage here is that we didn't have to program each of these occupants to do these things. We just had to have two behaviors, one that's go to this other part of the building and another one that is stop and look at this thing or wait at this point for a moment. And then the triggers or the, what was called attractors at the time defined who would do that and when. So it's separating the what you're going to do from the when you're going to do it. And what we've done is expanded that, and this is kind of a humorous example, but it shows you the power now that we have with triggers and the way we've attached it with various other capabilities, such as changing the, um, uh, the animation or the model that goes along. And so this is basically a set of armies. I think we have you know, some sort of goblins or orcs on one side and knights on the other. But they are all seeking one another, and then there's a battle behavior that's happening, and then there's randomness in there, so a certain percentage of the time, one side or the other wins, and then they move on, like when they complete that battle behavior, they do another seek behavior to find another of the other side. And so you can basically create these kind of rich behavioral dynamic environments, and we didn't have to program each of these occupants to do this. I mean, there probably still are. I actually didn't get from Richard who put this one together. I don't know how many behaviors and triggers are in this to make it look all cool. But even at the end, then they have another animation and now they're, I guess that's a Fortnite dance maybe? I don't know, I'm too, too old to be in the know. Um, so what exactly is a trigger? I already kind of touched on that. It's the when or the who is affected on a new behavior. And so this can indirect, indirectly cause a change to anything that we can already put in a, those behavior actions. So um, there's a lot of things in there. So you can change the goal, you can change the profile, you know, so occupant properties, you can even just override a specific property without completely changing the profile. And we also have a newer concept where we can set tags, or basically, you know, flags or, or it's like tagging your, your Gmail, essentially but you can put keywords on, on occupants that then control future behavior or future triggering. And then we can also make these triggers be based on time or location, or also, as I mentioned, have probabilistic impacts too, that you know, it only affects a certain number of people that come by. Um, so when you define a trigger, I mean, you get kind of standard Pathfinder, there's a whole set of properties up here but basically the important parts of the, a trigger has awareness. So it's the awareness of, that an occupant is in the influence of a trigger. There's the influence, which is how strongly that trigger is going to affect the behaviors of occupants. Susceptibility, which is the other side, and I'll go into these in a moment, of, of an occupant's version of the awareness and then tags. Um, all of those can control 
when a trigger and an occupant interact to change a behavior. So as far as awareness, you know, when can a trigger cause something to change? Primarily, there's location. So it's a spot on the floor with a radius. Oh, if you get within two meters of this, something might happen. Or you could be in the same room, like you place a room, a trigger somewhere in this room, and then anywhere you come in the room, you'll be considered for the change of actions. Or we also allow a set of rooms. Or it could be global, which can be useful for time-based triggers, where you just want everybody in the model to do something at a specific time. For example, switch from some circulation behavior to, oh, the fire alarm went off, now everybody needs to leave. Um, so this is an example of a trigger that's set to turn these simple occupants red. At the top line, we have a trigger who is just a simple radius awareness. It's the full width of this corridor, so people who come through here are going to, when they get in this region, be told to change, and in this case, I believe, just change their profile, not their entire behavior from you know, a normal color to a red color. This one is the same room, is the awareness uh, trigger, so anytime they, they cross into the room of the trigger, they will be influenced. And the last one is a set of rooms, but essentially you'll have the same behavior as the second one, because as soon as they cross in, you'll see occupants change color. So that's just illustrating those differences. And that's kind of the point of my talk today, is not to teach anybody how to do anything, but just to kind of make you aware of all the various options that are out there that at some point you might find useful. Um, this is another version of this where there's also some details, like in addition to um, just the geometric inf or awareness, uh, you can also have how many times you need to be made aware of a particular trigger before you respond to it. And in this case, we're going to have a moving trigger attached to a, another occupant that moves through. And these occupants are only going to assume their new behavior, which is like, get out of my way, when they've seen the third person go by. So there's one. Nobody's doing anything. Here comes two. Still nobody's getting the message. And here's three. So now everybody's like, oh, OK, we better get out of the way of these guys. Um, then there's influence, which is really where you can kind of put down, OK, now these occupants are aware. They're in the awareness zone of this trigger. How likely are they to be impacted um, or have the behavior changed by that trigger? Um, and this can be uh, set in time. And you can ha basically have a time value or time and, and percentage ramp over time that maybe at time zero, it doesn't do anything, but at time 30 seconds, it affects everybody, or only affects 20% of people. Um, on the other side of that is susceptibility, and that's set in the occupant's profile again. So under the movement tab, there is susceptibility to triggers, and this is actually split up to give you a little more flexibility as well. Um, and this allows you to kind of have a two-way negotiation of whether an occupant's going to be affected. So you may have a trigger that says 10% of the people are going to go to the bathroom. But you might have a profile that says, OK, these are the iron bladder people, I guess. right? <laughs> they're going to be immune to that trigger. So they're never going to change to the go to the bathroom behavior as a result of it. So basically, what that results is is that the, the influence that was defined in the trigger is taken times the susceptibility, susceptibility in a particular occupant to get the total probability that you're going to change the behavior of that particular agent. Um, and this can be overridden. In the end, we allow the, the trigger itself to be the controlling one, and there's an option in the trigger to ignore the susceptibility part of the uh, occupant, which essentially then treats the susceptibility as 100%. So here's an example just of that, much like the trigger one. Um, at the top, we're going to have a, the occupants have a susceptibility of 25, but the influence is 100, so the final should be 25%. Um, the next one, it's 50 versus 100, so you're going to have 50% uh, of them. And again, I think this is the, a trigger to turn them red. Um, 25 times 50, you'll have even fewer. And then 25 times 100, but this has ignore susceptibility, right? So we're actually not going to use this at all. And I believe this bottom one is the same, too, because it's also ignore susceptibility. Um, but it has a time factor, so at the bottom one, it's not going to turn on until time equals 50. 
And you can see those varying percentages of people being triggered by these definitions inside the model, which roughly over time should equal those total probabilities. Obviously, it's a large number versus small number thing. I don't know if we've hit 50 seconds yet. Come on. And now you see the bottom one being effective as well. Um, this also can be made quite a bit more complicated with the use of tags. Um, tags are another filtering option on a trigger that can control which occupants are considered and not. Um, and so this is useful. Or, tags themselves can be useful for organization and search of your model, even without using triggers. But they can filter the trigger and allow them to only act on either occupants that have a tag or that don't have a tag or have a set of tags. And combined with one of the behavior actions that is to set a tag, you can create complicated chains of events with this. Um, so basically, you can even create a state machine out of this if you want and have you know, an occupant start with no tags as they wander around. Some trigger might give them a tag A, and then there might be another one that is only going to affect ones with A and change them to B or, or whatever you dream of. Or if, and if these were global triggers, you could really just have it be a state machine of when occupants do something, they're going to do something else. Um, I have a brief example of that, too, again, with a turn red trigger. Um, this top one only accepts green occupants, this one rejects green occupants, and then this bottom one only turns half of the occupants red, and then the last one will turn them yellow if they are red. So this one requires sort of that chain example that I just mentioned. So you can see, I probably have to, I think I have this keep running, but you'll see in this one, none of the green occupants get turned red because they're being filtered out. And here, only the green ones are being turned red. Whereas down below, we can see some percentage of the blue guys get red and only the red ones turn yellow over here. So these are simple examples, but like that, you know, goblins versus knights version, you can get really complicated things. And I'm quite certain that probably used tags to make it all work, partly because tags are the key to making cool animations work as well. Um, but as you layer these together and you have multiple triggers that might affect an agent behavior, you have to have some way to decide, well, which one's gonna override. And so that's where trigger rank comes in. And so you can set a rank that controls, um, like we had on that last video, um, once you have more than one trigger that might apply to an occupant, the one with the higher rank is going to take precedence for the behavior change. And this is really useful for things like alarms or other things that might override. You know, maybe you've reached a trigger that I keep saying, go to the bathroom. I don't really need to go to the bathroom. But um, you might be in the midst of that trigger, but maybe then the global trigger goes off that says it's time to exit. And so that would have a higher rank. And that's basically what's being exam uh, in this example is that we have occupants that enter and are just basically looking around or using the restroom. A few low rank triggers are controlling that behavior. But then at T150, um, we have two global triggers with a higher rank, one of which is going to make a fourth of the occupants delay a little bit and then leave. And the other, another fourth are going to wait for a bit longer and then exit. And then later on, we, we successively tell more and more people to exit until at time 250, that has the highest rank of all and basically says any occupants that are coming in here are gonna immediately have the exit behavior. Um, so we can watch, this is sped up quite a bit, but here's people circulating, doing their little side tasks and going to the restroom. And then, are we at T, how fast are we gonna hit T150 here? Almost. Jeopardy music. There's 150. So now you have some people either going to exit or waiting a little bit and then exiting. And then at 200, even more exiting. And then at 250, we'll see everybody, no matter what they're doing, will have been overridden with the highest rank trigger and is being told to use the exit behavior. Um, this is a similar example of you know, how do you handle these multiple things going on at once. But this is, shows that when you're done with an action, you can actually resume what you were doing before, too. So these triggers just delay someone. They, they wait around. Maybe you're talking to someone at the cocktail table. But when the trigger's over, you can have it then sort of like pop off the stack and continue what you were doing before. Um, there's decision time. I'll try to keep it short, because I can see that I'm leaning toward the longer version of time here. But um, 
you can control how quickly something happens after they become made aware of a trigger. Um, it's kind of similar to pre-movement in general. It's like, what's your pre-decision time, I suppose. So, and this just has a variation of um, times. I should just go ahead and run it while, while I talk about it. Um, at the top, there's no delay, so people become aware of the trigger. It happens right of the way. In the second one, there's a delay of two seconds. So two seconds after they've been affected by the trigger, something might happen. Or this one is a fixed time. I don't know what happened there. It froze. Oh, it did that thing again. Okay, well. The screen's just showing me nothing, so. All right, I'll turn around and talk to the screen instead of to you guys, but that's okay. You're all pretty anyway. Um, so this was running. Okay, and then down here we have a fixed time, so nobody here is going to do anything unless they have reached 50 seconds. And then uh, at the bottom, automatic, I think, is more immediate, but you've got some people waiting before they do something on that one because they started with a weight behavior. Anyway, just showing the, the various things that you can do here. Um, dynamic and transient tripling. It we kind of alluded to this when we showed like the firefighters coming through and moving along, but it, it's really powerful once you take this concept of a, a trigger and you allow it to move either through space or time. So, um, what you basically do then is take whatever trigger definition you have and you can turn it into a trigger template. So it's a template of triggers that are going to come and go over time. And then those can either show up at a fixed location, um, the location at the time of, of the creation, or they can follow an occupant around. Um, and so this let, leads to some really rich behavior. Like you can even model information flow. Like the trigger might be to tell someone that there's the need to exit or need to do something but it might also include attaching a new trigger to that new person. And so then they can propagate that information, um, which uh, this is just the creation portion of that, but it shows the three options that when the trigger triggers, you can either have it drop on the floor where you were, it could follow the occupant around, or it could be at a fixed spot. Um, but this is one of the, this is the information flow combined with moving triggers. So everybody that comes in is assuming that they want to go all the way to the right, but the first person who reaches this trigger zone says, oh, I need to turn around and choose a different path, but they carry with them a copy of this trigger. So it's moving along, and so anybody who comes within that influence will also achieve the same behavior. And so we'll see that happen here. And if there's a big enough gap in people coming in where nobody's heard about the hazard ahead, they'll continue ahead until they see the hazard and then propagate their own information. So this is a way you could do even, you know, awareness of an event, fire, hazard, et cetera. But pretty cool. And I don't even think we exactly thought of that at the beginning, but once all these things came together, it's like, oh, we can do an awful lot of things here. But, and this lets you do a lot of complicated, like I mentioned, social behavior, more complicated drills that combine things together. Um, even active violence simulations where you might have an active person coming in to do harm or threaten people and then model reactions to that, uh, results of that. And combined with uh, custom animations, you can do a lot of different things with that. Like, you know, if, the, if that threat actor does come in and harm someone, you could change an animation so that now someone's lying on the floor. You could have responders move toward, uh, pe people flee. Um, and not exactly trigger related, but we can also swap CAD geometry during timeline at given time. So you could very much have like um, an explosion or some hazard and then change the appearance of the 3D model as well. Um, if you were trying to sort of, that gets toward the sort of just 3D modeling aspect of things. Um, but this is an example of just the various animations that can be set now if you import your own custom animations and triggered like, as this person walks um, I think we have a person who has like a waving animation, but then when they're in the realm of this person, they've been triggered to use a different animation, a different idol, and then similarly when he leaves, um, yet another animation. It's kind of subtle there, but you can chain those together and create more listic views than we originally ever had with Pathfinder. Um, 
Similarly, you can do grouping without grouping um, in that these people have a trigger that's to go find members of their own tag or kind or profile and collect them, and then they get a behavior to follow their leader out. Um, so you can basically do grouping without grouping. Um, and then here's, like I mentioned, you can do active violence type uh, simulations. Well, this is maybe a threat actor coming in, causing some kind of harm. People realize that, begin to flee. Um, you can chain these however you want to assume um, whatever you're trying to model. Uh, com you can combine that with many things, like this is the same model, but with an increased social distance that gets changed and triggered at a later time, which then makes people even try to remain even a little farther uh, from the threat as it moves through. Um, in addition to that, there's pretty cool, I shout out to Dan Swenson here, who had just recently revamped our subway model using a lot of these concepts, um, both for circulation and for evacuation with triggers. Um, so check that out. There's a lot of good information there. Um, like to acknowledge everybody on the team. Um, not everybody worked on triggers, but everybody has touched Pathfinder over time. Um, and it's a really great group doing a lot of good work. Um, I think that's all I had. Any questions? Oh, and I had 48 seconds left. That worked out really great. Thanks, Brian. Here you go. That's, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, one of the thoughts that came to mind is, uh, can you trigger something based on FDS predictions? Um, the, the concept I'm thinking of is you're in a facility, there's no actual detectors, maybe it's legacy, it's not required for some reason. You have to make some assumption for how long it takes for humans to detect the fire. Uh, but you could then have like an FIC type criteria or some thermal criteria and have the first person who um, meets that trigger a detection then to start your movement. Yeah, I mean, conceptually you could do something like that. I mean, we obviously don't have direct connection with FDS data at the moment in Pathfinder other than for like the FED type. But certainly, I mean, what we'd recommend to people with that now is, you know, you do your fire model and then you look at your tenability and if you say, oh, this spot is going to trip over at this time, then you could put a trigger at that location with that timing and then run your, your Pathfinder simulation. Um, and it would use that, that time to then, if you wanted either the information to propagate or for it to you know, ring the alarm and notify it and change everybody's behavior. But that is one really relevant parts of it is anybody that wants to simulate the pre-evacuation movement, just often people want to do that just because it looks good, but then trigger the evacuation from there, you can combine it together. That would just be one simple global trigger at a given time to then switch everybody to the exit behavior. Yeah, and there is a feature request already kind of in our system to be able to sense, use sensed information, kind of like FED, but quantities to, as an input to triggers, so, but it hasn't been implemented yet. Anything else, questions? Any other questions? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, oh, there you go. Oh, go ahead. Across all of the past and current features of Pathfinder, are you particularly proud of any one feature that you guys have rolled out? That'd be a hard question. That's probably like picking between your kids. So that's okay. That's usually not that hard no. if you're honest. But I do think this is some of the most exciting stuff because it opens up a realm of possibilities. I mean, since it is kind of separating the, the what from the, for, or the what from the how, it's a, sometimes a little hard to get your head around how to make it do what you want, especially if you overlap a lot of probabilities and percentages. But it's pretty impressive what you can kind of do with it. I mean, we're not going to replace the massive simulation that goes behind like, you know, Lord of the Rings armies for, you know, industrial light and magic or those kinds of things. But there are cases we've spoken with uh, like factories or industrial uh, modeling problems where they're either looking at say sorting facilities with robots or um, shift change in industrial floors. I think there's a whole host of just human movement issues that we can now probably model because it's not just evacuation and someone doesn't have to sit down and write you know, 500 different behaviors to, to make it look that way. Now they can set up triggers that sort of model many different approaches, which may not be as relevant to people in this room, but for you know, um, 
more general crowd modeling, I think there's a more applicability. Yes, Kevin. Are, are there like validation data sets, like experimental data sets that would let you test some of these new features? Because I know there's cases where you just look at people getting off of a train car or you're looking at people meeting in a hallway and there are certain um, patterns that form that you could test right. against. But this is sort of a higher level where now, yeah. now you've got psychology involved. I mean, is there, are there, I don't in know. The, in the people movement world, are there? Like, I don't know, honestly. Get a bunch of college kids and have them do a certain thing. And some then of that does happen. There's yes. some good stuff even out of, I think it was uh, ULIC and, and uh, the EU uh, that had some you know, more complicated movement. But again, they tend to mostly be focused on movement and not decision making. Um, yeah, but yeah, so that is right. an interesting thing, and 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 again, that's the key here. Is there's really not AI in the you know modern ML sense of the word, you know, where these agents are deciding what to do. It's still basically the person at the console, right? Creating it's base, basically visual programming with these triggers, right? You've right. just separated the if-then logic from sort of in the behavior or the the occupant's right. movement loop to, right, to this right. two two pieces, right, right? To make it a little more modular. Right. But it's still, you know, the assumptions that the user is putting in at the moment. So, I mean, we do kind of kick that to the other person. It's like, well, I don't know. What are you, what are you trying to model? And so what can you find to help validate right. those decision right. points? Right. Yeah, it would be interesting to get a couple hundred people. They each get some kind of profile. And but there is data. They're given a simple task to yeah. do or information to transfer to someone of their ilk. Yeah, I, I, I would just be curious if there I are think such there, data sets. There's more out there. I mean, I, some of it tends to be semi-proprietary, but certainly groups like Movement Strategies, GHD, or Populous, who actually has offices here in Kansas City that does, you know, Super Bowl planning and stuff like that. They do have data on like how many people use the restroom or how many people go to concessions and when they go to concessions. Yeah, yeah. And so that may not be validation, but if you were trying to model one of those events, I would, you know, the obvious choice would be to use that data. This would allow you to input it, right? You'd have this timing where this trigger, maybe this trigger is always there, but it has right. this heightened influence during halftime or just before fourth quarter or whatever the assumption is. Right. And then you could tweak that and. And it's kind of like the parade model we saw earlier. I mean, it's not really being made to be entirely predictive. It's kind of testing out. Right. We want to try to make herd the people this way. <laughs> and so if we do that, will it work out about like we think? Or will we have areas where we might need to rethink about putting right. people? Right. Thanks. So. Right. We do have a question online. Let me see if I can read it here. I've got the negative counting red numbers now, though. Yeah. So. Oh, here we go. Is there a way to set an exit to be more attractive compared to others? For example, set one exit as the main entrance, so occupants tend to go for that one, or to prioritize, uh, prioritize the enclosed staircases to non-enclosed staircases? You could accomplish that a couple of different ways. Um, one way, we already have the, the nearest exit model. There's there's ways to limit the doors in that, so you could by default, you know, limit that to the known entrance doors that most people use. Um, I guess I'm starting to answer the question the other way around. But you could then also, if you wanted at some point for people to learn about more exits, you could have a behavior that switches that profile or that behavior, or a trigger that switches that behavior or profile to include more exit doors, and then people would go to more. But it can go the other way as well. Um, so it's really flexible enough to do any or either of those. And tagging helps with that to some degree too. Okay, well, right. looks good. Thank you, Brian. Okay.